core dissonance in the in the like chord, it works perfectly with these harmonics. Every time it changes time. Who, who, who announces that and when? Where? John has, John would like to send individual messages, but he should just send it on the group to me. But I was confused. I thought it was tonight. I would go to evening prayer. Yeah. Well, I will have an intervention with him today. Tell him to stream light his communication. <laughs>
call to worship? No? Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So, so glad to see you here. Uh, all spaced out with your mask, appropriately social distancing. Thank you kindly. Uh, if you would please stand. Uh, we're going to pray and then sing to God. So let's pray. Jesus, we love you so much. And we just lift up your name, uh, the most holy of all names. Uh, the most powerful, Lord, uh, you are good to us. And it is just a gift to be your children and be together and get to um, relate on this, this Christian walk, which can be so tiring and wearing, um, which you modeled for us, Lord. Uh, you did not tell us at all that this would be easy, simple, that people wouldn't hate us, that we wouldn't get injured. Um, but you provide us with the strength, Lord, and the support in each other and in your spirit uh, to make it through. And so we just give you all the praise for being our number one provider uh, and healer um, and, and our, our best lover. Um, you are so good to us, Jesus, and we're just glad to be here and invite you to be in this room with us. Um, let your spirit fall in this place. Uh, we don't want to be apart from you, not this morning, not this evening, not any day. We just want to be with you in all things, always. So thank you, Christ, for even considering us worthy to dwell with. Uh, it is an honor. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Lift every voice. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies, let it resound loud as the Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. Stony the road we trod, bitter the chasing rod, felt in the days when A steady beat have not our weary feet come to the place for which our parents sighed. We have come over a way that with tears has been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughter. Out from the gloomy past till now we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far. Stray from the 
places, O oh God, where we met Thee. Blessed our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget Thee. Shadowed beneath Thy hand, may we forever stand, true to our God, true to our native land. Shadowed beneath. Shadowed beneath thy hand, may we forever stand. True to our God, true to our native land. Amen. Emmanuel, here we are. A little slower, Andrew. We long to feel thy touch. Deep wounded souls to thee we fly. O Savior, hear our cry. Sing, heal us. Heal us, Emmanuel, here we are. We long to feel thy touch. Deep wounded souls to thee we fly. O Savior, hear our cry. Verse 1. Our faith is feeble, we confess. We faintly trust thy word. To feel your touch, deep wounded souls to thee we fly. Oh, Savior, hear our cry. Remember him who wants a with trembling cold.
glad you're here we are we long to feel thy touch deep wounded souls to thee we fly oh savior hear our cry heal us emmanuel here we we long to feel thy touch deep wounded souls to thee we fly oh savior hear our cry be seated. Someday we won't have to do all of this, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Good morning. <clears throat> my name is Cynthia. It's my um, pleasure to welcome you this morning. Um, we're glad you're here, whether it's here in person or online. Welcome. Here at SOMA, we aspire to be an inclusive community. No matter what your background, where you've been, or where you are today, we are glad you're here. Our desire is for you to find a place of belonging here at SOMA where you are seen, known, and accepted. Not just by us, but by the God who calls you beloved. Got some announcements for you. Um, first of all, please remember to sign up online to um, reserve a spot for the services. Uh, you can do that uh, through the link in the um, weekly email. If you, you're not getting that, um, if you're at home, online, place a, um, your email address in the comments. And if you're here, you can sign up with the cards, the info cards that are on your table or the QR code. Or if you don't have email access, talk to Pastor Caleb and he can um, take care of getting you signed up for a spot. Uh, just a reminder, for there will be a prayer time right after this service uh, downstairs for unreached people groups. So if you want to make your way downstairs, if you are up here for that prayer time, it's just going to be in between services this morning. Also, uh, tonight, youth group, grades 6 to 12 at 6 p.m. here at the well. Please uh, come and join in. Next week, we have Children's Environment once again at Neighborhood North, which is just a couple of blocks up on 14th Street from here. Uh, children, I believe it is ages three, two, three, two, ages two through elementary. So if you have any questions on that, um, we'll get you some answers. Also, uh, coming up on Friday, the um, PBS Black Church Part 2 documentary is going to be shown here at the well, 2 o'clock, down in the basement. 
So if you're able to join in for that, please do. Also on Friday, Fridays um, throughout Lent, Tiger Paws is doing a fish fry at the old Tiger Paws Church. And if you, um, it's going to be from 11 o'clock to 5.30 on those Fridays. If you'd like more information, just stop into the Tiger Paws Furniture Bank up on 7th Avenue. Whew, I think that's it for um, announcements. So let's get ourselves into a posture and a mind of prayer. Um, one of the things I was thinking about this week, preparing to lead us in prayer, is I've been thinking a lot about hope. And hope was mentioned in a couple of the songs we sang today. Um, we can live with a lot of, without a lot of things, and I think we've sort of learned that over the past year. But hope is not one of those. And I have a couple of verses to read quickly about hope and about God with regard to hope. Um, both of these are from the, the letter to, that Paul wrote to the Romans. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. And later he says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm so thankful that we serve and love and are loved by the God of hope. Maybe this week you've had disappointed hope. Or maybe you've found hope that you were surprised by. Wherever you are, um, these truths, this, this is true, that we, we are loved by the God of hope. So will you join me in prayer? God, we are grateful that you are a God of hope, that you have not left us <clears throat> without hope, and um, that we can come to you and bring to you our hopes and our dreams, our needs and our desires. Thank you that you invite us to come to you. Lord, it is in hope that we pray for Clark and for others who are jobs this week, who really need to have a job to provide for themselves and their families. And so we ask you to provide that. Lord, we pray specifically for Clark for this interview that he has tomorrow, that you would, if this is a, a good fit for him, that will um, use his skills and his talents and um, provide for his needs and his family's needs, that, that he would get this job and that you would make a way for that. Lord, we're aware in our community that housing is not easily available to everyone. And so we pray for those who are in crises with regard to housing and those who are in transition with regard to housing. Lord, we pray for boldness and creativity for some of us in our community to buy and offer affordable housing in our community. That we can those who are looking for housing. And Lord, we continue to pray for our children and our youth in our community that you would give them hope and surround them by people who offer We worship you, and we love you, and we thank you that you love us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Soma, church family. We're going to step into our time of passing the peace this morning, and just to, for anyone that may be new here, if you're upstairs or downstairs, or if you're online, the way we do things around here is if you uh, do not want to be approached for conversation, just stay where you're seated, and if you would like to be approached in a COVID safe and you're comfortable with having a conversation, social distancing with someone you may not know, then feel free to stand up and you can m make your way around the room. What I'll ask is keep your masks on and make sure that we're just uh, honoring each other's space as we do this. Uh, what we always do is we touch base with someone that we know 
and introduce ourselves to someone that we may not know so we can continue to build relationships even during a time that is very difficult to do so. Amen? And so let's press in for a moment. We will get back together in a few minutes, and let's get to know each other. If you're upstairs, if you're downstairs, same thing. If you're online and you are not with anyone else, feel free to call a friend or text someone and, and have a good touch point. Let's pass the peace of Jesus Christ together. Okay, friends, let's make our way back to our seats. Be not afraid to continue those conversations after the service. Amen. We have some good energy in the room this morning, 9.15. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. Sometimes our passing of the peace time is, uh, is 
more than we may expect it to be. Not just a time to say hello to someone, but a time to be awoken by the family of God. Amen? A quick word about honored guests. If you're a Christian and you meet someone new, the Bible tells us and shows us clearly that hospitality connected to guests makes every guest an honor of guests, a guest of honor. Amen? And so I want to make sure to make something very clear before I introduce our speaker. If you're new here, in whatever form and fashion you've decided to show up, you are now our honored guest. And my prayer would be that you receive that, and if you are part of our church family, part of our spiritual family here at SOMA, and you see someone that you haven't seen before, it is our responsibility communally to make sure that person feels like an honored guest. Amen? Let the church say amen. Amen. So with that being said, we do have a, a, another honored guest who is joining us this morning, who is bringing the word of the Lord to us. I'm not going to give a, an enormous and large introduction. I'll just be plain and simple. Timotheus is a trusted friend, a powerful brother, and because he is a Christian, he is now part of our family. Amen? And so we talked a few weeks ago about the concept and the idea of meeting someone for the first time and saying, hello, brother, what's your name? <laughs> hello, sister, what's your name? And so this morning we can say, hello, brother, what's your name? And Timotheus can tell us and show us a bit about who he is. And so, uh, Timotheus is the director of City Kids Camp, which is uh, part of Summer's Best Two Weeks out on the east side of Pittsburgh. Uh, him and I have been good friends for a while, and he uh, used to come to Geneva and still does come to Geneva on a consistent basis to speak and to connect with students. And so we're honored uh, for technically the second time to introduce him to us, but the first time was only a virtual visit back in the end of March or beginning of April last year. And so if it looks like a familiar face, it's because he has preached to us before, but the first time here in the well together. He, he was, was wearing a hoodie, yeah, 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 Sa same person, yeah. He was. <laughs> oh, that's good. Uh, Timotheus, I will let you pray for your own sermon, and so without further ado, our honored guest, Timotheus Pope. It was a Nike hoodie, actually. Um, <laughs> thank you, sir. Hey, uh, go ahead and grab your Bible, take it out, and turn it to Philippians chapter 4, family, and I'm going to um, read this text for us. The text that we'll be in this morning, which is chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. And then I'm going to pray, and then we're going to have some fun this morning, at least I hope. Uh, I'm going to share God's word with you. I am not a sermon title person, uh, but every once in a while, I shouldn't say every once in a while, most of the time when I preach, the Lord gives me a message to leave you with. And that message this morning is wounded healers. And you'll see that hopefully in the text and from the text. And so, this is Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, oh, by the way, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It'll sound a little bit different than yours, but very similar. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. I love you and long to see you, dear friends, for you are my joy and the crown I receive for my work. Now, I appeal to Euodia and Satunke, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. And I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women, for they worked hard with me in telling the others the good news. They worked along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are written in the book of life. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all that you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard our hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. I said verses 1 through 10, is verses 1 through 9. Let's pray. Father, what a great and glorious and beautiful day. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be with your people here at the Soma Gathering at the Well. Thank you that the body of Christ, the church, is the people. And we have often mistakenly centered your church around buildings and processes and programs and 
But at the end of the day, uh, the people who claim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ are your people. And then you've called us to love one another the way that you have loved us, according to John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. You said that that's the way that the world will come to know that we are your disciples, that we've learned from you, that we've sat with you and gotten to know you and experience you, that we would have love one for another. And so we pray that as we look at your word this morning, that's what we would do. we look at your word, and then we would, as your word is a mirror, uh, look at our circumstances, and that we would conform to the truth of your word. That we would look at the relationships we have in life that are broken or that have dissonance, and that we would press into those relationships instead of running from them. I pray that you would let it be known that you're God, that I'm your servant, and that I've said all these things according to your word, not mine. And I pray that you would hear me so that all the people in this room and all throughout the world would know that you are God and there is none other. We pray that in the great and strong name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Hey, this morning I want to share what God shared with me in this text as I walk through it myself. I want to share that with each and every one of you, uh, whether you're online or you're here. And so in Philippians chapter 4, we dive in right in uh, three points this morning of the context uh, of the, the message wounded healer. And point number one is the context of this passage. This is one of those passages that I'm sure you have heard before, uh, particularly verse 6, particularly verse 8. You've probably heard, be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. However, if you are not familiar with the context of that, then you might think that that is for you in a way that it is not necessarily for you. It's not that it's not for you, but I just want to show you the context in which Paul communicates these things. Rejoice in the Lord. I want to show you the context. So, verse 1 begins with the word therefore. My Sunday school teacher Jerry Carter used to say all the time, whenever we see a therefore, we need to figure out what it's there for. And so, we, I, I need to say this early on. Scripture uh, was not written with books and chapters like you see it now. That was done for our benefit in order that we might know where it is because it'd be a little bit harder to say, hey, in Paul's letter, the 17th word on the, in the third paragraph, like that's harder to do than chapter 3, verse 7, right? And so that being the case, there was no break from chapter 3 to chapter 4. So I want to read this the way that it would have been read publicly at the church at Philippi, which would not have been like this because it would have been in somebody's house. So somebody's just standing up reading a letter, kind of like you get a piece of mail in your house and somebody might read it out loud. What they would have heard is something like this. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows that they are really enemies of the cross of Christ, they are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they only think about this life here on earth. Just keep that in mind. But we, talking about the body of believers, are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak and frail mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. So the therefore is there contextually because he's saying, hey, since Jesus is going to return and this earth is not our home, we should stay true to our heavenly home. Instead of us thinking that earth is where we belong, Earth is not where we belong, and it's not where we fit. So if you are here and you're trying to fit on earth, that's never supposed to be the case because it's not home. Uh, I've been a missionary in, uh, I've done mission work in South Africa and Lebanon and Thailand. I'm just here to tell you that is not the place from which I derive, and therefore I did not fit in any of those places. And since I did not fit, I recognize this is not my home. I'm not required to fit. But... But when I come back to America, it's easy for me to say, well, this is my home, but I recognize I don't fit here. It is uh, the ending of Black History Month, and so I, we, we all can recognize that there's not necessarily a fitting or a belonging even in that regard. And so I would at some level begin to think, well, where am I supposed to fit? Nowhere, because this is not home. I don't know if y'all uh, have been to other people's houses where you start treating other people's houses like it's your house. The example I often give to college students is I, I, I have all the freshmen raise their hand, senior, uh, sophomore, junior, seniors, and then I say, hey, if you treat your freshman dorm room 
like you would live there for the rest of your life, somebody would think that you're touching the head. Because if you started painting the walls and you started trying to reshape things and you took down the closet space and you started building shelves, somebody would go, hey, dude, you're not living here next year. Like, and you're going to have to pay for all of that. Somebody's going to tell you, I hope you get the point, that's not home. Like, this is a dormitory and you're going to be moving shortly. This is a temporary place and not the place where you should eagerly await because this is not home. I just want to tell you, earth is the same way. Contextually, Paul is saying everything he's about to say in these next nine verses, the context of that is this staying true comes from the reality that this is not home. This is not where you should have the best, the brightest, the greatest things. This is not where you should be looking to rest the weight of who you are because this is not home. So when something is not home, and that's the therefore, he says, stay true to the Lord. I love you. I long to see you, dear friends, for you are my joy and the crown for which I receive, the crown I receive for my work. And I was telling uh, Caleb and Caleb's dad this, this is my problem. Whenever I come to a place like this, and I tell my wife this all the time, I just want to move in and live there and serve and love with people and hang with people and that kind of thing. But God hasn't called me to live in all of those places, right? The good news is, I identify with Paul when he says, I love you, I long to see you, like I long to be around you. And there are tons and tons of believers that I know, friends that I have, that I'm like, I long to be where you are. I long to be spending time with you. But I begin to recognize um, that, that earth is just the place where we kind of get to know each other. Heaven is the place where we get to have a blast for eternity. So as I get to meet my brothers and sisters here, like Paul says, I want to encourage you contextually to stay true. The thing you need to know contextually is Paul didn't just start making that up in verse 17 of chapter 3. This is Paul's entire point, which is why he says in chapter, seven, in chapter 3, uh, verse 18, For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears, that there are many whose conduct shows they really are enemies of Christ. And so as you all have worked through the book of Philippians, you know that he earlier said there are people who are preaching Christ for the wrong reasons. And so he's only returning to the point that he's made since the beginning of the book of Philippians, and he comes here to the end of his letter, and he's communicating to them, we want you to stay true because this earth is not home. If you don't get that context in mind, you're going to miss everything else that I'm about to say because I'm getting to enter the hard space just as Paul does. But Paul reminds them, earth is not home. This is not where you should fit. This is not where you should belong. Verse Three now, well, verse two now. Now I appeal to you, Odea, and to Sutunke. These two women are women who are having some form of dissonance. I'm not quite sure what the dissonance is, but don't lose the context. In my Bible, there is a small break and a heading that says words of encouragement. And so if you have that same thing in your Bible, you can forget that he just said, therefore, stay true or stand firm in the Lord. And then he appeals to these two women who are not of the same mind. Your translation might say, be of the same mind. Paul likes this word. It's the Greek word for neo. He likes this word. This is the word that he uses in chapter 2, verse 2. I want to show you where he uses this word in other spaces. Chapter 2, verse 2, he says, Make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and one purpose. The next place he does that is chapter 2, verse 5, when he says, let this mind be in you or have the same attitude as Christ Jesus. He does it again in chapter 3, in verses 15 and 16. He says, let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you, but we must hold on to the progress that we have already made. So he uses the same Greek word. We use different English words, but the whole time, He's talking about the mind, being of the same mind, being of the same understanding. The way that my professor um, David Kane in college described understanding, he said, you know that you understand something when you're willing to stand under it as being true. And so what Paul says is, these two women, he desires them to be of the same mind. Well, what mind is he talking about? The same one he's talked about in chapter 2, verse 2, and chapter 2, verse 5? chapter 3, verse 15, and chapter 3, verse 16. What is that mind? The mind that Jesus has. And what mind does Jesus have? He has one that is humble and one that is honest. And then he describes these two women. He says, 
I ask you, my true partner, my true yoke fellow, he's talking to somebody that we don't know who that is. Now, behind the text, contextually, just so you are aware, um, we don't know if this was an actual person named Syzygis or if he just used the Greek word Syzygis to mean yoke fellow. He could have been talking about the entire body of believers in Philippi because he calls them his joy and his crown, and then he would say my yoke fellow, maybe talking about everybody, or maybe he's talking about one single person. This we do know, whoever Whomever he may be talking to, he's, he's, he's putting them, he, whatever he's getting to say, he's talking to these three people. He's talking to these two women, and he's talking to whoever his true yoke fellow is. I am of the mindset, and I believe he's speaking to the entire body of believers in Philippi. I'll show you why I believe that in just a second. But he says, I ask you, my true partner or yoke fellow, to help these two women, for they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. He communicates that these are two believing women who have served with him in telling people the gospel. Now, again, we tend to think that those two women then were like I am right now up front proclaiming to mass audiences. And while that might have been the case, I'm not quite sure. What I do know is they definitely would have labored with Paul, sharing the gospel with people. And so Paul is saying, hey, they were serving with me. What does that let us know? Well, that lets us know even Christians can have conflict. So point number one is context. Point number two is conflict. Uh, I'm in counseling, and my counselor said these words. I will never forget them because they're important to me. He said, when you have two people in a conversation and both want to be heard, you inevitably will have a conflict. But when you have two people in a conversation where both desire to hear and be heard, you can then have a conversation. Now, I don't know what these two women were had dissonance over. Here's what I do know. They are women who are serving with Paul in ministry, and Paul's admonition is to help them. So for Paul, there's no such thing as just letting these women continue in dissonance and division. For Paul, there's no such thing as Euodia and, and Sutake saying, oh, she know better, she know better, I don't need to go address this. As far as Paul is concerned, if those two are not going to settle this, he's saying to the true yoke fellow, Syzygis, whoever the yoke fellow might be, and again, I believe it's the whole body because I don't think that is on one person. I believe if you look at the context of Scripture and what Paul says all throughout the book of Philippians, he's talking to the entire body at Philippi. So he's saying, hey, true yoke fellow, those of you who truly are in a walk with God and understand him, Go help them. I already read to you what he said in chapter 2, right? I'm going to return to it just as a reminder of what he said uh, in chapter 2, and I'm going to go back to chapter 1 shortly. Verse 1, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from his love, listen, and fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Somebody might say these are rhetorical questions. They may not be. Because Eudea and Suntike are, are, are whatever is going on there. And apparently Paul is saying help them, not saying that nobody was helping them, but Paul is definitely letting them know you can't just let this division continue. Listen. Then, verse 2, if there is these things, then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one another in one mind and purpose. Do not be selfish. Don't try to impress other people. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only on your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude as Jesus. So, so just let me return to context for just a second. I just wonder if Paul has these two ladies in mind, even when he's writing that in the letter. I can't imagine it's just these two ladies. I don't know about you, but that, that fits a lot of us. But here Paul references these two ladies and he tells the true yoke fellow to help them. I want you to note in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time here because this is important. I don't know if y'all heard me use the word, even if you use the word carefrontation, not confrontation, but carefrontation. Loving people enough to get any business. Loving people enough to get in their face. This is what Paul says in chapter 4 of Ephesians, beginning at verse 1. Therefore I, Paul... A prisoner for serving the Lord beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. The Greek word he uses there for worthy is the word axios. It's where we get the word axiom, 
which means a self-evident truth. Paul is saying live in a way that it is clear and evident to other people that you belong to Jesus, who was not like the people he came to die for, serve, love, and give himself. For you have been called by God, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Listen to this. Making allowance for each other's faults because of your love for one another, make every effort to keep yourselves uh, united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Because there's one body, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Listen to me carefully. Paul does not believe in allowing division to continue in the body without it being addressed. Now, I need you to know, the Apostle Paul didn't make that up. God don't like it either. That's why Paul says it. So all through the scriptures, we see this. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 18, if you look at the context of Matthew 18, the text that we quote all the time, that we say, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm in their midst, and whatever they ask for in the name of my Father, I'll do it. Uh, in, in, in my name, if they ask the Father, I'll do it. We don't know that the context of that is, chapter 18 begins with them arguing over who would be the greatest. What Jesus does is he brings a small child and he says, unless you're like one of these little children, you can't enter the kingdom. And then he says, but woe to those who offend them. Be better than a millstone, be wrapped around the neck. And then he says, so if your right hand offends you, cut it off. If it's your eye, cut it out. And then he returns to these little children and reminds them that the kingdom is like a little child. And then he says how to address somebody who's overtaken in a fault. You go to them personally. If they don't listen, you bring a brother. If they don't listen, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word will be established. And so then you bring the church. If they listen, you've won your brother. If they don't listen, then you treat that person like a tax collector or a non-believer. That doesn't mean to treat them bad. It means to treat them like they don't know the gospel, which who should you, how should you treat people who don't know the gospel? With all the love and the compassion in the world. He was not saying ostracize, cast them out, excommunicate, and never talk to them again. What he was saying is, now you continue to remind them of this gospel that they may not believe. Doesn't that sound like Paul at the end of chapter 3? I'm just reminding y'all, hey, Jesus is coming. Just reminding you he's going to change our mortal body, therefore stay true. And I'm here to remind you this morning that the essence of the gospel is pressing into dissonant relationships. I know we live in cancel culture. I know we want to cut people off. People quick to cut a friend off, boy. People won't call you back. They won't text you, but they'll tweet, and then you get angry, and you, I'm cutting them off because they're not my friends. They lie to you, and then you, you cut them off because, now this is a toxic relationship. It's always amazing to me that we're willing to call relationships toxic without looking at our relationship with Jesus. Is it not toxic? Let me just press into that a little bit. So toxic that he died. Just get that in your mind's eye. He became the toxicity of sin for us in order that we might become his righteousness, and yet and still we are in relationship with God acting like he doesn't love us or care about us. We're the toxic ones, and does he cancel us? And yet he calls us to love each other the same way. Y'all know it's easy to love the people who love you. It's easy to love the people you don't have dissonance with. Sometimes we say that we are just getting along with people. No, the reality is they're a lot like us, so it's a lot easier to love them. But I'm just here to tell you, the Christian that is, a, that is willing to allow dissonance without pressing into making every effort to keep the union of the spirit in the bond of peace is somebody who is saying the gospel is not worth it to me. Right? That's why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 to, 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 to be kind-hearted and tender to one another, forgiving one another. Listen, even as God in Christ, chapter, uh, chapter 4 verse 32, has forgiven you. Why is he saying that? Well, because Jesus said, love one another even as I have loved you. Well, if we're going to love each other like Jesus loves us, when there's dissonance, does Jesus go, I'm going to my room and we're not talking anymore? No. Does Jesus say, hey, when you get yourself together, we'll talk again? No. What Jesus does is he presses in because Jesus recognizes when you're running from him that he's not the problem. And we often will say that the other person is the problem. As a good friend of mine said recently, I said, hey, listen, these people have offended you, but just because they have offended you doesn't mean you shouldn't press into the relationship. He said, it hurts. I said, I get that, but that's the gospel. The way that the world will begin to see the gospel, the way that the gospel actually works is when you press into a broken relationship. But when you don't and you can go your separate ways as a believer, how in the world is the world going to know the gospel? 
That's been the hardest heartbreaking thing of the polarization of political nature in America right now. It's like, that's why nobody wants to listen to the church. We keep talking about reconciliation and healing and all of that, and we don't want to repent. That doesn't make sense. So for Paul, uh, because of the Holy Spirit, there's no such thing as these Christians just going, I ain't ready to talk to you. I don't want to talk to you. I'm never talking to you again. Oh, I get it. Somebody's going to disagree and go, well, Paul said the people who are being divisive, he said in the book of Titus, which I just posted on Facebook because a friend of mine posted it, he said in Titus, don't have anything to do with those people. Paul is not saying don't love those people. What Paul is saying is don't join in with their gossip. And he's saying, don't turn around and do to them what they've done to you. Treat them the way that you would desire to be treated. So yeah, when somebody's lying on you or gossiping on you, don't you dare turn around and start lying on them or gossiping on them. Listen, when you do what is right, your righteousness will shine forth like the noonday sun. So if people are beginning to turn their back on you because of somebody else's lie, I'm just here to tell you, that doesn't mean you turn your back on those people. You press in even more. Why? Because you're making every effort to keep your union of spirit in the bond of peace. If somebody won't come and talk to you about something somebody else said about you, that person has an issue. Guess what? Their issue isn't just with you. Their issue is with God. As I said recently, I don't think we understand. When you're a husband and a wife and you're not willing to press into sexual intimacy with your spouse, your issue is with God first, not your spouse. If you have a friend and you, a brother in Jesus or a sister in Jesus that you're not willing to press into relationship, your issue is with God before it's with that person. And if you understand that, then you can go, oh, okay, great, got it. What I've done is created this skinny path next to the narrow path of the gospel where my skinny path tells me I don't have to press in. And it even uses scripture. It says, well, Romans 12 tells me to live at peace with all people as much as lies on me. I've done everything I can. I don't need to talk to them anymore. But that's not seen in the context of Romans chapter 12. That starts with, I urge you in light of God's mercies to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It makes sense. God gave himself for you. You should give yourself for him. Don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect, the perfect will of God. Well, what is God's will? To press into broken relationship. So conflict, all conflict is in the body, is an opportunity for the gospel. That's why it's a point. So context, he's saying, hey, since Jesus, this is not home, I need you to press into conflict because that's where the gospel will be seen most. Y'all know we don't like conflict, we don't like confrontation, and we certainly don't like confrontation. Listen to me very, very carefully. You really want to live the gospel? Press into conflict you don't want to live the gospel, run from conflict best you can, because that's, that's, that's exactly how you be not like God. Adam and the woman sin in the garden. God says, I'm going to take a week off. Well, I talked to them. No, God comes walking in the garden, the Bible says, in the cool of the day, right after they did it. Hey, Adam, where are you? He presses right into the conflict. Wanting to be heard and wanting to hear, he asks a question in the conflict first. He doesn't put a value judgment on what they've done. Too many of us Christians do that, too. We step into, you lied on me before we go, hey, what did you say and why did you say it? That's a question. And when we have the opportunity to hear first, when we seek to understand before seeking to be understood, and again, don't get me wrong, I done failed at this a million times. I got folk who won't speak to me now because of the way that I failed. Guess what I'm still doing? Pressing in. And people will say, you're trying to control it. You're trying to save face. You're trying... No, I'm trying to, I'm going to stand for, I don't care, I'm standing for Jesus at some point. I don't think people get that. Like, at some point, I think this is Paul's point at the end of chapter 3, and he's going to come back to it in just a second. Well, I'm going to come back to it in just a second. He came back to it already. I'm going to get there. Paul is saying, you're going to stand before God. Like, before you keep looking at these people and saying, well, it's their fault because they're jerks. What if God thought like you think? What would your relationship with him look like if he thought like you think? thought like I think. Let me move into point number three so I don't preach for an hour and a half. I'm glad that y'all laughed at that. That means you're, you're okay with me not doing it. Um, he says these words, they worked along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are written in the book of life. That's another reason why I think that Yoke Fellow is not just one person but the body. I think Paul is ad admonishing the body to help 
When you see two people having dissonance and they won't speak to each other, Paul is saying, help them. Somebody go talk to Yodia. Somebody go talk to Suntike and get them together and help them. So instead of being in their ears and being their ears so you can talk about, like, Suntike's posse is talking about Yodia and Yodia's posse is talking about, no, get them all together. So I've told people many a time, hey, I'm happy to sit in a room. I'm happy to be recorded. I'm happy to have as many people in the room as you want to because I don't care about being right. I care about being righteous. If I'm wrong, I'm willing and ready to say, hey, I was wrong. I did the wrong thing. I'm very sorry. God forgive me, and you forgive me too. But I first need to have a conversation. Point number three is the conclusion. We're not concluding the whole letter. I just want to give you Paul's conclusion. Remember the context of what we're about to read in verses 4 and following is what he just said at the end of chapter 3 for us, but it's a consistent thought in the letter. And he's speaking to the whole body of Philippi, Eudea and Suntike, verse 4, that you're familiar with hearing. Always be joyful in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. I wonder why Paul says that twice. Would you rejoice after you know you got to go confront somebody? Seriously. Get that in your mind's eye. Let's say two of you have dissonance in here and everybody in the room know it. Nobody's, everybody know that you got division, right? I know of a church at this point where the mass people sit on one side and the, and the non-mass people sit on the other side. There's clearly division. And everybody's just okay with the division. Nobody's pressing into it. Nobody's saying, how do we love each other? People are talking about people. Right? And I walk in and go, hey, listen, y'all need to fix this. Now listen, rejoice. Enjoy each other. How in the world am I supposed to do that with somebody I'm about to go confront? How does that look? Does that context make more sense now as to why Paul is saying it? He's, this is not a random rejoice. This is not a psalm rejoice. This is a, I just told y'all behind to go and make sure that these two women are getting together rejoice. Chapter 1, verse 7. I told you I'd get to chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 3 through 7. Every time I think of you, talking about these Philippians, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy, for you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard until now. And I am certain that God, who began a good work within you, will continue this work until it is finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So it is right that I should feel as I do about you all, for you have a special place in my heart. You share with me in the special favor of God, both in my imprisonment and in my defending and confirming the truth of the good news. God knows how much I love you and long for you with tender compassion of Christ. Paul is letting them know, look, because I love you, because I love you, I'm telling you to press in. And since I love you, I'm telling you to press in. And not only am I telling you to press in, I'm telling you to rejoice. Some of you got dissonance in your family. Some, some conversations you need to have that you haven't had. And you are thinking right now, well, they're not going to listen anyway. I'm reading through the book of Ezekiel right now. God didn't say to Ezekiel, hey, only speak when they listen. In fact, he says the complete opposite. He says, they're not going to listen to you. Tell them anyway. Because the point is for you to communicate the message. You know what I've learned um, as I grow as a Christian? We have made Christianity about everything outward instead of everything inward. And I know that sounds a little bit backwards, but let me tell you what I'm saying. We think that it's about them listening, receiving the information, and then it being important to them. When it's about us hearing from God, getting to know him and understanding his heart and how he feels. So if we are not going to tell them because they're not going to listen, what if God thought the same way? I'm not going to tell them the gospel because they're not going to listen. No, that's not what he does. He continues to communicate to you so you might know him. The point of Ezekiel, when you look at Ezekiel, over 92 times, God says, here's my message, and he ends with, and they will know that I'm the Lord. Well, guess who gets to know the Lord the most? Ezekiel, as he shares the message. But if Ezekiel would have went to the Lord, they're not going to listen. I ain't wasting my time and my breath and my energy. No, Ezekiel, you're doing that not for them. You're doing it for me because you get to know me. And in the midst of that, you'll also learn to love them as I love them. Many of us have escaped that. We'd rather other people believe the gospel than believe it ourselves. Grace applies to everybody else but us. 
Mercy applies to everybody else but us. We can communicate the gospel and God's love for them, but it's hard for us to believe his love for us in the midst of our circumstances and situation. He says to rejoice, verse 5, let everyone see that you are considerate in all that you do. You think that somebody you got dissonance with, is you going to be considerate? You think if you got dissonance with somebody, you walk into a room and they're sitting on one side of the room, you think you're going to be considerate in all that you do and go sit where they're sitting? Like, think about the context now. Let your moderation be known to all. Let your temperance, let your patience, let your gentleness, let your consideration be known. Listen, and then Paul slips this in there. I love this. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. That's the end of chapter 3, verse 17. He's going to change our mortal bodies. He just reminded them. Oh, so you want to have dissonance now? I just want to remind you, Jesus come back. All of a sudden, we all in heaven together. Now you see this person for eternity. Better figure it out here. Because you can step into eternity in 10 seconds or less. And now you're stuck with this person forever. Their family. I think Paul's point is very simple and one that we can hold on to. Paul is constantly reminding them, this, this earth isn't home. Then he says, don't worry about anything. What if, what if, what if, what if, what if, I, what if you, you idea goes to reconcile? What if I, as a truth, your family will try to help them? What if they get mad at me? Don't worry about anything. But in everything, tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Then you will experience the peace of God. Well, why is it so important to experience the peace of God? Well, because he just told me to press into dissonance. Who wants to do that? And when was the last time somebody said pressing into dissonance brought peace? So whatever your political affiliation might be, however, whoever your uh, football team might be, however you might focus in life, Paul is giving us this command in light of dissonance, y'all. Like, think about this. Don't worry about anything, but, but why would you need peace? Well, because I'm going to go into this hostile situation where Yodia and Suntike may not want to talk to each other. And what happens if they stop wanting to talk to me too? It says these words... You will experience the peace of God, which exceeds anything we can understand. I'm always amazed by that because he says the peace will come and it, that, that, that you don't understand, so you won't understand it, right? We want to do everything that we can understand, but he says, no, this peace is going to come, and you won't even understand it. Well, guess what? In order for peace to come in the midst of circumstances, uh, and you don't understand that peace, you've got to have some circumstances that you probably don't understand the circumstances either. Like, you can logically get there. Yodia's mad because she went to serve Paul's family in this way, and Suntike showed up at the same time with the same sweet potato pie. And Paul said hers was better. I'm just making that up for the fun of it. I don't know what the dissonance was, y'all. What I'm saying is peace comes where there's dissonance. And guess what that reminds us of? The gospel of Jesus. The dissonance between the beef between me and God is that my sin separates me from him. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. And yet he presses into that, presses into the point where he dies. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, I just got one final thought. Fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. I always wonder why Paul said that. Maybe it's because my thoughts immediately go to what is going to happen when I go press into this dissonance. What's going to happen when I start making every effort? Well, let me, let me tell you. Don't, don't fix your thoughts on that. Fix your thoughts on what's good, what's true, what's pure, what's honorable, what's just, what's right. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Listen, keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me. That returns us to what he said in verse 17 of chapter 3. Hey, follow my example. Oh, what example, Paul? Where did you have dissonance? Oh, Paul and Peter. Galatians. I had to contend with Peter to the face because he stood condemned as related to the gospel. Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas wanted to take John Mark. Paul didn't. The Bible says the contention was so strong that they went their separate ways, and then he grabbed Silas. And the story we know of Acts chapter 16, where my namesake is born, Timotheos is who they meet in chapter 16, with Paul and Silas, they didn't go to prison, and they sing in the prison. That happened, and Silas was with him because of the dissonance between him and Barnabas. Paul is not absent on dissonance. 
Paul fought with some folks, and some folks fought with Paul. You remember that they said, some of you say you're from Peter in, in 1 Corinthians. Some of you say you're from Apollos. Some of you say you're from Paul. That's dissonance right there, y'all. That's my favorite pastor. That's my favorite bishop. That's my favorite overseer. I like that elder right there. Paul's saying that stuff shouldn't exist. Paul says very simply, then the God of peace will be with you. And when I read that, I go, wait, is the God of peace not with us now? Like, what, what, Paul, why would you say then the God of peace would be with you, or and, some translations say, the God of peace would be with you, as if he's not with you now? I don't think that's what he meant. I don't think he meant that God's not with you. I think what he meant is something similar as to what he said before. Then you will sense his presence in a way that you know his peace is with you. you have, look, God's everywhere, but that don't mean you sense that he's everywhere. It's kind of like my kids when I'm in the house, but they don't know because I'm upstairs and I'm in my office and I'm doing stuff, and they don't know I'm in the house. And then I'll come down the stairs and they're all startled, like, I didn't know you were here. It's like, well, I've, I've, been here, I've been here all day. Um, I don't know who you thought was walking in our room, but I was the one walking, going to the bathroom and everything else. So, yeah, I was here. But you didn't know I was here because you were preoccupied with something else. It wasn't that my presence wasn't here and that I wasn't making myself known. It was that your preoccupation with other things did not uh, bring consciousness that I was here. Let me tell you when my kids recognize when I'm there. My kids want to do something that they know they shouldn't do. When I'm in my office, my kids will come. They'll creep. They'll open the door. They'll shut that door. They'll see I'm in there. They're going about their business. Because they want to do something they don't want to do. They, they, they're not supposed to do. Because they know, hey, if I do this and dad's here and dad knows I did this, there could, be some, <laughs> there could be some trouble involved. What do they do? They open the door, they crack, they look. I got seven kids, y'all. They look, open the door, they crack, they look. Oh, we didn't know you were, I, didn't, I didn't know you were here. Okay, what you need? Uh, is mommy in here? No, mommy ain't in here. You know mommy not in here. You've been all throughout the house. You know mommy ain't here. You're not looking for mommy. You're trying to figure out whether or not daddy's here so you can do something. <laughs> when daddy says yes to what they want because they've, instead of being anxious, they've come to daddy and they've asked and said to daddy what they need, they shut that door with a lot more confidence and they return downstairs to know that daddy's presence is there and he said yes. And now even if mommy comes and says no, they can say, but daddy said yes. If another sibling says, you can't do that. No, da daddy, said, daddy said I could. So if you got an issue, listen, go take it up with daddy, not with me, because this is what I'm, this is what I'm, I can do this. I have permission. Let me return to what I said. You have permission to make every effort. You have permission to press into the dissonance. You have permission to go into those spaces where confrontation is necessary. My encouragement to you, my challenge to you is, that's the gospel. If you don't want to do that, you don't want to be like Jesus. That's who he is. So don't you dare say, God, I want to be like you. And then when dissonance comes, you know, I don't want the dissonance. Well, you don't want to be like me. So why'd you even say that? God keeps his promise all the time to turn us into Jesus. We don't want it. Isn't that what he said? Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For those he foreknew, he conformed to be predestined to the image of his son. Well, if that's what he's doing, if he's conforming you to the image of Jesus, that means he's pressing you into that mold. If he's pressing you into that mold, guess what you need in your life? Judas. Jesus had one. You need a Peter who's your ride or die, and then as soon as you need something, they dip on you. You need a Lazarus who's a really close friend who's going to die. You need a Mary and a Martha whom you love dearly, but at some point when something like their brother dies happened, they blame you for it and act like you got the issue. That's who Jesus was. He was the epitome of marginalization. I was talking to a mentor of mine the other day. Now I'm on a roll, so I'm just going to keep going, and I think I'm at the end here. We were talking the other day. Just want you to process Jesus' life. His life was born from trauma. Just think about the trauma of Jesus' life. You didn't probably walked up to your parents. Maybe you haven't. I don't know. Hey, tell me my birth story. What does that sound like for Jesus? Well, see, we was headed to Bethlehem. She was pregnant. You, <laughs> you mind, but you're not really. Um, you, you born from God. And so she was pregnant. And there was no room. And so in a stable, man, and like, your umbilical cord, and I, and I had a rock, and think about that. I know we laugh, but like, that's like his real story. Like, that's legit. 
Yeah, so then what happened? That Well, at that time, the government was trying to kill you, so uh, we moved to Egypt, right? Or maybe he just said, oh, yeah, after that, you know, we, we paid the taxes and moved to Egypt. Well, why'd you go to Egypt, Dad? Did you have a, did you have a job in Egypt? Like, Mom, why'd y'all move to Egypt? Well, I don't know how to say this, Jesus, but the government was trying to kill you, so, so we moved. We don't have to go back to Egypt? No, nah, I don't think that's a good idea either. 12 years old, he's left for three days in Jerusalem. Just get that in your mind's eye. Y'all remember the awkwardness of middle school? You remember the sixth grade? Left in Jerusalem. I don't know what he ate. I don't know where he slept. Just think about that. I would assume at that time he had to have other siblings, so I'm just like, how, does, how do Mary and Joseph have the Messiah and lose the Messiah for three days and don't even know? I wonder if they were like I am with my seven kids counting heads and they going, hey, y'all seen Jesus? And their cousins was like, he was just in them over there. And just, so they all just caravanning together. I just want you to know his life was born of trauma. All the things that you go through, that's why Hebrews 4.15 says, we don't have a high priest who cannot be, t- uh, 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 who cannot be tempted and, and doesn't know what we've gone through because he was tempted like we are. That can't feel our infirmities. Man, he knows. That's why Isaiah 53 says he was familiar with suffering. You want to be like Jesus? Get real acquainted with grief. If you don't want to, you don't want Jesus. You want some skinny path next to the narrow path of who Jesus is. You don't want marginalization, you don't want Jesus. Because his own people betrayed him, and he was murdered under unjust Roman rule. Remember, Pilate tried to let him go. What happened? Hey, if you let him go, no friend of Caesar's because he said he was a king. Oh, yeah, y'all got to kill him. And that was Pilate's response. And then he washes his hands as if everything is cool and this is completely just. I'm just here to tell you, when you see those things, those kinds of things happening to you, it's only God keeping his promise to complete the good work from chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Father, in Jesus' name we pray that you allow us to recognize that all of these wounds that have come on us, to us, in us, are so that you can be the healer, and then from our woundedness, we can live the healing that you desire. And so, Lord, I pray that we would be wounded healers. As Jesus' life was born of trauma, many of ours are as well. And he was wounded for our transgressions. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was wounded for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace was laid upon him by his wounds. We're healed. And we thank you that we can be wounded healers, that we can take all of the brokenness that has occurred, and we can, as true yoke fellow, press into the conflict and be the gospel the way that you've called us to be the gospel. God, I pray that I would do that, that we would do that as the body, that we would recognize there's no such thing as just letting that toe of the body hurt for no apparent reason, but it's pressing in providing blood, and all the things that are needed for healing. Teach us, Lord, to be like you. I'm going to be honest, God. I don't want that all the time. I'm praying that you would be gentle. I'm praying that you would just show me the way that you desire for me to go in a way that I really do get to know you and love you. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Keep your head down your eyes closed for me real quick. If you're an elder, deacon, pastor, Certainly have your head up. If you're not, I'm going to ask you respectfully to keep your head down. If you're in this room right now, you would say, Timotheus, if I'm going to be honest with you, I do not know Jesus to be my Savior. I do not understand this gospel. I don't stand under this gospel. If I'm going to be real with you, I don't know Jesus to be my Savior. If that's you, would you raise your hand, slip it up, and just, hey, that's me. If I'm going to be honest, if I died right now, I know I'd bust hell wide open when gasoline draws on. If that's you. All right, cool. Second question, if you're in here, you would say, Timotheus, I'm not sure. I would love to tell you with the confidence I hear in you that I know Jesus and that he knows me. But man, if I'm going to be honest with that stuff you just said, I don't know that I believe that good news of the gospel. If I'm going to be real, if I died right now, I, have, I don't know if I would go to heaven. If that's you, would you slip your hand up and say, yeah, man, that's, that's me if I'm going to be honest cool third question for me this morning. If you're in this room and you would say, Timothy, I'm a believer. I know Jesus. He knows me. Brother, I got a lot of wounds. I'm not at the healing part yet. At least it doesn't feel like it. I know know what the gospel does. I know I'm healed. I know all of that. But man, if I'm going to be honest, 
These wounds are not your scars. They're still open, many of them, and I'm bleeding out. That's how it feels. I've been cut. I feel like I am the UOD. I have dissonance. I have conflict. I've been cut. I've been wounded. I'm not there at the healing yet. I hear what you're saying, but I'm hurting. If that's you, would you raise your hand if you're in here and you like that? Just be honest with God. Be honest with yourself. It ain't about me seeing it. It's about him as you're honest. Thank you for your honesty. Fourth and final question for me uh, this morning, if you're in here, you would say, Timotheus, I'm scared to death to be that yoke fellow in the middle. Timotheus, if I'm going to be honest, I heard what you said. I know, that that's, I know that that's the gospel. I know I'm supposed to do it. I know I'm supposed to have these conversations. I know I'm supposed to. I do not want to do that. I do not want to go there. I'm running from that. But that's where I am if I'm going to be honest with you. I want to do it, though. But right now, I'm dreading it. If that's you, would you raise your hand if you're in here and you like that? Thank you so much for your honesty. Again, God sees that. I'm going to pray for you one more time, and I'm going to get out your way. Lord Jesus, for every person who raised their hand, I pray that they would learn to rejoice in the Lord always. As I say it again, to rejoice. They would know that they can not be anxious about the conflict, but... They can pray through the conflict and confrontation. That they can with petition let their requests be known to you and your peace will rule in their hearts like a referee giving them everything that they need, everything that we need. Allow us, Lord, to press into the gospel, to believe that Jesus loved us enough to come into our toxic lives and save us from sin as a wounded healer that we might be Wounded healers as well, doing Lazarus ministry, resurrecting some relationships that have died. Pray that you would do that in the great and strong name of Jesus, your son, our champion. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now. If you're in a a place in a space before we move to the communion table, if you're in a place in a space where you cannot imagine the type of healing uh, that Timotheus is preaching on, I'd invite you to stand and sing that verse again. Amazing grace, how sweet. The sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind. But now I see. Let the person that is without sin be the one to throw the first stone. May we all set down our stones and come to the cross together. On the night that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was betrayed, he shared a meal with his closest friends and followers. And after that meal, he took bread and he broke it. As he broke it, he looked at his disciples and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Then he took a glass of wine, he poured it out. And as he was pouring it out, he said, this is my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Apostle Paul tells us, the same person that wrote the letter to the Philippians, tells us that as often as we take this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim 
the death of Jesus until he comes again. And so if you are a follower, a believer, and a lover of the one who has created you, redeemed you, healed you, and walks with you, this communion table is for you. Let us go to a time of prayer together to confess our sins. Lord, we cannot be wounded healers until we meet the wounded healer. We cannot be righteous until we know the righteous one who loves us. And so we confess that we have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not loved our neighborhood as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son Jesus, have mercy on us and forgive us. Grant us your grace, your peace, and your forgiveness as we come humbly to you, Lord, to heal our wounds and turn us around to be wounded healers. In the name of Jesus, confess, we confess our sins individually and corporately. We confess our, we confess our sin of pride. We confess our sin of gluttony. We confess our sin of racism. We confess our sin of oppression. We confess that we have not stood by the side of our neighbors who are struggling. We confess that we have sinned by not standing up. We confess that we have sinned by not speaking up. We confess that we have sinned that believing that peace is something that it is not. We confess that we have sinned by being okay with division and non-dissension. Lord, we do confess our sins individually and corporately for all the things that we have done and for all the things that we have left undone. We confess and we receive your forgiveness. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. As you heard me say, the communion table is open for those who believe in the name of Jesus as Savior, Healer, Redeemer, and Friend. Come to the table, if you will.
Let's stand and sing. Like sweet, sweet honey on my lips Like the sound of a symphony to my ears Like holy water on my skin
May the grace and, and peace of the God who was wounded for us, who died on the cross and who rose again to conquer the grave, may that grace and peace rest richly within you, both now and forevermore. Amen. We are going to ask for us to make a quicker transition than normal because we have a lot of people who are here for the second service. And so if you can gather your things and say hello to a few and then make your way out, that would be good. Uh, we will have a few people over here for prayer if you need it. And God bless you, and we'll see you soon.